Okay, so um, last time we talked about the production of axions in the universe and their initial conditions. We um, first of all talked about the initial conditions arising from inflation in the scenario in the case where where petroquin symmetry is broken during inflation. And then we talked about various methods to produce hot axions from their interactions, either with the standard model or with some kind of modulus. And these were, you know, interesting, uh, but as we'll talk about next time, the iso curvature perturbations are limited to have small amplitude. The dark radiation and the hot dark matter that were produced in this in mechanisms are also known to be subdominant in the universe. So, okay, we can derive limits from these processes but they're not, you know, telling us axion should be here and around us and observable. The mechanisms I'm going to talk about today um, for strings and vacuum realignment, um, axion production from strings and vacuum realignment are really the most important um, things you should, I, I think, not, like, know about axion cosmology because this is what gives us cold dark matter. And both of these mechanisms give us cold dark matter. Okay. Right. Okay, so I'll return to our uh, order of service from the beginning of last time, which tells us about how to, or how to order events in, the, in axion cosmology. We have petro quin symmetry breaking, which occurs when the temperature drops below the decay constant. That's when the fluctuations in the wine bottle potential become smaller than its radius, and then the particle can be localized in the, in the heel of the bottle. Then we have the time when shift symmetry breaking occurs, that's when the axion potential switches on, when the wine bottle starts to tilt due to the presence of the, inst of the instantons or other non perturbative effects. And then we have the axion field evolution, the time when the Hubble friction becomes smaller than the axion mass <coughs> and the state of the field really starts to move down to its, to its vacuum value. So the important, uh, the most important distinction when it comes to the to the dark matter uh, density to start with is when is Petro Quinn symmetry broken. This divides the, um, the axions into basically two um, caps. The symmetry is either broken after inflation or it is broken during inflation, during or before. Um, I mean, the symmetry is not, um, is, is, is not, the U1 symmetry is, is not, is broken during inflation. Um, and okay, inflation here, you don't have to believe in inflation to make this separation. I just mean that it is broken before, it is either broken during the usual hot universe, or it is broken um, during the generation of initial conditions. You could replace inflation here with, um, with any scenario for generating initial conditions and you would get the same, um, you would get the same outcomes here. So it's not intrinsic to inflation, I'm just using that because um, inflation is, is the best theory of initial conditions in my opinion, um, and the most common to be talked about in the literature. Okay, so scenario A, petri quin symmetry broken, it is only broken after inflation, gives us these strings and mini clusters, which I'll talk about. And in scenario B, which we outlined a little bit about yesterday, um, we only have to worry about the axion mean field when it comes to the dark, to the, um, to the dark matter relic density. Okay, so just to, in both of these scenarios, I'm going to be considering the evolution of the cosmic axion field. Uh, so the axion field is generated in both of these cases in this classic classical condensate that we got from, um, from the symmetry breaking of the petri quin field. So in scenario A, the petri quin field is smoothed over the entire universe and put into, it, put into a condensate by inflation. And then, the, and then that complex field evolves, as I'll talk about, and gives us um, an axion field that is also, also in a condensate. In, in scenario B, the axion field itself is stretched by inflation and clearly lives in, in, in a mean field condensate. Okay, so this is the scalar field action that we need to solve um, the equations of motion for. So this is the action integral d4x, square root minus g, canonical normalization, and potential. We apply the Euler Lagrange equations to this. D mu delta s by d mu phi minus de um, delta s by phi <coughs> zero. And we derive that box phi minus d phi v is equal to zero, where box 
takes this form. So we have a one over square root minus g because we divide that off from delta s by delta phi, which gives us just square root minus g b phi v. We divide that through and then we get d mu of square root minus g, g mu nu to raise the index of d mu here um, on d mu phi. So this is the box operator. And in the Friedman Robertson Walker space time, you can just work out, you just know the metric components, you know it's, you know it's inverse, you know square root minus g. You can just compute box trivially. It's minus dt squared minus 3h dt plus natural squared. Okay, so for f of w, we should, we should strictly ignore this because we shouldn't be considering gradients of the field. Um, but, we, but when the curvature is small, we can include it for an inhomogeneous axiom field propagating on a Friedman background. So what's the energy momentum tensor next? You've seen um, the energy density for axions already written down um, in Jens's lecture. Where does this come from? Um, so we know that our matter um, action, sorry, our, our matter Lagrangian, which we just wrote down before, should really be included with the Einstein-Hilbert term, as we talked about in lecture two a lot. This is the Ricci scalar. And the only Lagrange equations from this whole action give us Einstein's field equations. And the only Lagrange equations for the metric give us Einstein's field equations. So G mu nu, which is just the Ricci tensor minus uh, the metric times the Ricci scalar, comes from the variation of the, of the action with respect to derivatives of the metric. And the energy momentum tensor on the right on the right hand side comes from the variation of the action with respect to the metric. So this is this this allows us to define the energy momentum tensor of any matter we want <coughs> as long as we know it's Lagrangian. So when we do that, we can also express the components of the energy momentum tensor in terms of density, pressure, and velocity of a fluid. So under this definition, T00 is minus rho, TII is delta IJP plus sigma IJ. And T zero i is rho plus PV. Um, I need to I need to look this up because um, it was bothering me this morning. Uh, I think I, I believe that this decomposition, in particular in the vector in the um, velocity component here, which is assumed to be symmetric, um, does make some symmetry assumptions because this these components of the energy momentum tensor can only source scalar perturbations. They, not, none of these um, components can source vector or tensor perturbations in the metric. So I believe there's some simple assumption um, here in particular in the, in the velocities. Okay, so this defines the energy momentum tensor um, of the scalar field and allows us to talk about scalar field um, density, pressure, velocity, and things like this. And this is the energy momentum tensor for a canonically normalized scalar. T mu nu is g mu alpha d phi d phi minus delta mu nu um, fully contracted d phi d phi plus, plus 2v. So then in, Fried in Friedman, we can just read off the, dense the average density and pressure um, and they are non-vanishing for the scalar field. Rho is a half phi dot squared plus v and p is a half phi dot squared minus v. We already also talked about this in the case of the infoton um, in the last lecture. Here, this is, this is just a general potential here. This is going to be any potential you want. So this is the scalar field potential itself. So it would be half m squared phi squared, for example, or um, one minus cosine phi over f, something like this, or the, or the chiral potential, whatever potential you know your scalar field has. Okay, so um, a little caution um, and a note for next time for lecture five is that at the background level, there's no gauge dependence. So Friedman, Robertson, Walker is a background and there's no, um, I don't need to worry about the like, coordinate invariance and things. But once we, when we go to cosmological perturbation theory, when we start um, introducing, say, some fluctuations to this metric and the Newtonian potential of synchronous gauge metric perturbations, the entries of T are not gauge invariant, okay? And this, um, this, it, this is important in deriving some quantities about the linear evolution of the axion field. 
um, in, the in the next lecture that will derive. So keep in mind, T is not gauge invariant, but it's, it, its entries are not gauge invariant. Okay, so what does computing the relative density mean? We're interested now in just the background value of rho. Um, compute the relative density, what does relative density mean? It means compute the final value of the energy density given the initial conditions for the klein gordon equation. That's, that's, so we need, to, we need to take initial conditions for our klein gordon equation, rho at some initial time, and compute rho today. In principle, we could just solve the equations all the way from you know, inflation up to today. So, the co so um, but what do we mean, Rick? What do we normally mean? We mean compute the cosmic density parameter. So this is, the, this is just taking, the units, taking care of the units of this. So it's the energy density today times the H, where H here is the uh, reduced Hubble constants defined in this line here, divided by the critical density 3 h naught squared and Planck squared. We put factor the H out here so that, so, that our so that our measured parameter is, is a physical density and doesn't depend on the value of h naught. So for dark matter, for cold dark matter, we know this parameter. And um, if you want the axion to be all of the dark matter, uh, this parameter had better be 0.12 plus or minus 0.001. So really, and this is from the recent Planck uh, measurement of this parameter from the CMB. You see that we know that dark matter exists um, at pre as precision of better than 1%. Um, so H naught is 100 um, reduced Hubble kilometers per second per megaparsec. Of course, this means every megaparsec you move away from me, your um, Hubble recessional velocity increases by 100 kilometers per second. Um, but we're, uh, think we're thinking with possible physics hats on here. So I want this in electron volts. Um, it's H times the Hubble mass scale, where the Hubble mass scale is 2.13 times 10 to the minus 33 electron volts. This is an important thing to know. Um, okay, so our task is to compute the function rho of t0, which is some function of the axial initial field value, the axial initial velocity, and the axial mass, and whatever other parameters describe our model. For example, how we parameterize the temperature evolution of the potential, which we saw in lecture one. So we're going to start with the, we're going to start simple, and we're going to build up. The simplest scenario is scenario B, where the Petri Quinn symmetry was broken during inflation and not restored afterwards. We're just given this axion mean field. Okay, so the selected reading for uh, this case, uh, relevant chapters in my review, there's this really good paper by Watts and Shellard, uh, which computes um, the, axion, the QCD axion relic density with lots of, um, lots of detail on particularly the instance on calculation, um, which is very nice. Uh, Fox, Pierce, and Thomas, I'll use some of their fitting formulae for the QCD axiom, and this paper by Borsani et al, and a number of others by this group from around the same time, um, also give lots of great um, precise calculations for the QCD axiom, relic density using uh, lattice QCD results. Okay, so our task is to solve the Klein Gordon equation. Um, inflation smooths the background and just gives us um, a homogeneous field to start with. Completely smooth, neglect all the derivatives, all the spatial derivatives, this is what you need to solve. Phi double dot plus 3h phi dot, this was our, our box operator. And then d phi v goes to 1 over fa d theta u times the um, topological susceptibility. Remember our parameterization of the potential before, v is topological susceptibility, mass dimension 4, times u of theta, generic dimensionless periodic function. <coughs> Okay, so this is the equation of a damped oscillator, because this potential has a minimum. The damping is given by the Hubble parameter. It is in general anharmonic for the, um, for the use of theta that we looked at, for example, the cosine potential or the chiral perturbation theory potential. And it also in general has a temperature and thus time dependent mass. So, so in general, this is, a, this is a complicated oscillator. The key feature though, is that the Hubble friction dominates at early times. So at sufficiently early times, Hubble is large. We can neglect this term. Um, we can neglect the potential term. And any initial velocity that you give to the field, any initial fire dot just damps away and goes to zero. And we can choose this time 
to set our initial conditions. Does early time attract the behavior? So we set our initial conditions at the time when you've been drawn onto the early time attract, <laughs> drawn onto the phi dot equals zero solution. So um, aside for the cosine potential, uh, right, yeah. So aside, for, if we have a cosine potential here, you, um, this looks exactly like, and I just think this is cute, um, this just looks like the equation of motion of a circular pendulum on um, a table that tilts um, with a time dependent angle of inclination. So you know that the circular, so for the cosine potential, the, the, the theta of u is sine theta. So you know that this is the equation of a circular pendulum. So the pendulum beyond the small angle approximation. It rests on a table such that it has friction with the table. And when the table is tilted, it has a strong friction, large Hubble, and as the table tilts up, the friction vanishes and the Hubble parameter, um, the effective friction goes to zero. I just think that's quite key. Okay, we're going to start with the simplest possible version of this equation, derive an exact solution to it, and that exact solution displays all the key features that the numerical solutions we use later will show. So, here is the simplest version. I'm going to start with one, temperature independent mass. This is relevant if Hubble only overtakes, if the, if the potential only overtakes the friction after the, after the mass has reached its zero temperature value. For the QCD axiom, this is the case for large decay constants. Um, and for string theory axioms, this is basically always the case because if the axion is getting its mass from some string from, from um, say supersymmetry breaking effect or some stringy instant on it, the equivalent scale at which these um, the, the potential switches on would be say the string scale, and that is actually much larger than the than the energy scale. And um, I'll show you why. I'm writing on the blackboard for those in red. So our potential was some lambda to the four, one minus cosine theta. And I said that in the string case, this lambda was some hard scale mu, which tells us when this potential switch is on as a function of temperature, times e to the minus s, where s is our instanton action. And to have our light dark matter actions, s instanton is large. So the scale of the potential is much smaller than the hard scale. So for the string axions, you should, the mass, basically the potential has reached its zero temperature value before any dynamics happen. Okay, I'm, I will assume that there is no back reaction in the Friedman equation. Um, so I won't be including the axion energy density on the right hand side of the Friedman equation. Um, this is true whenever you want the axion to be all of the dark matter. Um, and because the um, transition H order M has to occur before matter radiation equality. When I show you the solutions, you'll see why this is the case. But basically, the axioms can't be, shouldn't be dominating. If, if they're going to be the dark matter, they shouldn't dominate the energy density during the radiation era, by definition, or else you'd screw up matter radiation equality. And um, the third simplification I'm going to make is I'm going to use a harmonic um, potential. <coughs> and this is relevant when the initial misalignment angle is smaller than one. So for our cosine potential, if, if theta initial is less than one, it just looks like phi squared. Okay, our assumption two is going to allow me to get my exact solution. Um, it, assumption two implies that the expansion rate, um, I can assume the expansion is dominated by a single fluid, which means the scale factor goes like the physical time to some power P. The Hubble rate thus just goes like P over T. And in the standard hot big bang um, radiation domination, P is one half. And during matter domination, P is two thirds. So if you make these assumptions, you substitute them into the Klein Gordon equation, you can get an exact solution in terms of Bessel functions, and here it is. So phi of t is a to the minus three halves, t over t initial, whenever you set your time as being on the same time attractor, to the half, c1, first Bessel function plus c2, Bessel function of the second kind, 
the n of your Bessel function is fixed by p of your background solution. So if p is one half, n is just one. <coughs> this is j, j1. And the constants c1 and c2 are set by your initial conditions. So, so if I assume that at my initial time, the field velocity is zero, then you can just compute these, this c1 and c2 by taking the time derivative of this. And the, in the case of the harmonic oscillator, it's li the equation of motion is linear in phi, and so the, the initial value of the field just scales out. And so I can, just, I can just solve this once and then multiply through by whatever initial field value I like, because everything's linear. The important features are the asymptotic behavior of, of this solution. At small time, by assumption, phi dot is zero, and phi just goes to some constant initial value. At late times, our Bessel functions go, to go over to cosines, and we just have this a to the minus three halves cosine mt. So if I plot this solution, this is what it looks like. This is the scale factor divided by some initial value. The field is initially on, the, on its daily time attractor, just described by some constant phi i. Then when the Hubble parameter drops below some power of some um, constant times the mass, Hubble falls, then the field, this time is marked by the dotted lines. The field starts to significantly deviate from its initial value and begin damped oscillations. The envelope of the oscillations is a to the minus three halves and their cosine mt. The equation of state of the field with w, which is just p over rho, I gave you p and rho before in terms of the phi, phi dot squared and v, you just substitute in this solution. The equation of state is initially minus one because phi dot is approximately zero. When Hubble becomes small, the, the phi dot starts to become large, and then the equation of state oscillates between a value of one and minus one with a frequency of uh, two mt, a frequency larger than this frequency. And this is the evolution of the energy density as a function of the scale factor. The energy density is initially constant, equation of state minus one. The axiom looks like dark energy at early times, but then once the coherent oscillations take over, the energy density scales like one over a cubed. And the approximate solution, which I have stuck on here in orange, is the approximation that I will be using later to compute the relic density. So once the, once the coherent oscillations set in, the energy density scales like one over a cubed. This is important because it means any numerical solution we, we do need to do, we only need to get solved into the regime where the, where the field oscillations become, homo, become harmonic. And then after that, we can just scale it like matter. So this is very important. A field in a harmonic potential, coherently oscillating, behaves like matter as long as the mass of the field is larger than the Hubble rate. Can you ask just the fluctuations because you're saying that any effect that the normal average? Uh, yes. Um, so in lecture eight, we will talk about. So, so normally we integrate out these, fluctu these fluctuations. So the energy density, the fluctuations in the energy density actually go away because sine squared plus cos squared is one. But the solutions here. Um, are at high frequency because sine squared minus cos squared is cosine two. And, and we normally ignore these, but um, pressure, but they, they correspond to rapid pressure fluctuations. And these look like scalar gravitational waves at this frequency. And they, um, you can derive constraints on them from pulsar timing arrays. So, we, and we will talk about pulsar timing arrays in lecture eight. Okay, so, Here's a useful approximation that will allow us to start estimating the relic density because the, the thing actually to, the important thing is, okay, why can't we just solve this equation all the way from initial time all the way to today? The problem, of course, is that these oscillations, although they're cosine mt, that time scale becomes much smaller than the Hubble time because Hubble has fallen. So we, 
So the oscillations are too rapid to follow in any um, exact solution all the way from say, let's say this oscillation occurs, has to occur before matter radiation quality, let's say it occurs at redshift 10 to the 7, you cannot follow that all the way from redshift 10 to the 7 to today. You need too, too many, um, you would need too many sample points in your, your numerical solution. Um, so we have to make an, an approximation and at some point stop following the exact evolution. So well, obviously in this case, you could follow the exact evolution because it's an exact solution, but with the numerical solutions, you can't. Okay, so a useful approximation is to take the energy density at some value of the scale factor, I call A OSC, to be equal to the initial energy density, which is just a half M squared phi squared, because phi dot is, is zero by assumption of the early time attractor. And then to fix some transition scale, 3H at A OSC is equal to MA. The numerical value of this three here, choosing this will improve the um, level of your approximation. You fit this to your numerical solution. But three is a fairly standard choice and it happens to give, um, it happens to give fairly good, fairly good, um, a fairly good fit to the full numerical solution. So we know, okay, we have this early time dark energy like behavior, rho A is a constant all the way up to AOSC, for A smaller than AOSC. And we, then we make an assumption of just an immediate transition and that you go to late time dark matter like behavior immediately at AOSC. So for A greater than AOSC, rho is then just its value at AOSC scaled by AOSC over A to the third power. You do that, and you take the uh, and you take this this, this um, solution in either the radiation dominated matter dominated or lambda dominated phases of the evolution. You can derive the cosmic density parameter omega as a function of the axial mass and the axial initial misalignment angle. Omega r here is the energy density of radiation, which you can express in terms of the um, of omega matter and the redshift of matter radiation equality. H0 is the Hubble constant today, and M Planck is the reduced Planck scale. I've put here, um, to be explicit, expectation values around phi squared. So the, the, this phi i always appears squared in my solution for the energy density. So I should really be taking the expectation values and including from the last lecture the effect of the uh, zero point fluctuations in this average. If the axion begins oscillating after matter radiation equality, AOSC is larger than A equality. The axion cannot be all the dark matter for reasons that we'll see, but, but this is kind of obvious if you think of the definition of matter radiation equality, but it can be subdominant, and the energy density takes this form. Interestingly, the mass scales out in this case. And if, the, if AOSC is greater than one, the axion is behaving like dark energy today. We will not discuss this case very much at all. Um, and then its energy density is, its omega parameter is just given like this, and it's just still the initial value. So you can plot this solution. In this, in this case, AOS less than A equality. You can plot this solution as a function of MA and phi I, and draw the contour when omega A is 0.12, when omega A H squared is 0.12, when you get the right relative density. Here is this function plotting. So I'm plotting the log of the density parameter versus the log of the field value in GV versus the log of the mass in electron volts. Anything above my contours is excluded because omega a is too large, you get too much relative density. Everything below the contours is allowed because the axions don't have to be all the dark matter. This is, this is nice and interesting. So let's put the initial field value to be somewhere near the gut scale within an order of magnitude. That's about 10 to the 15 to 10 to the 17 GeV. The initial field value is the initial angle, which is order one times the decay constant. So this is decay constant of order of the gut scale. Then what values of the mass give us the right relative density? Values of the mass between 10 to the minus 15 and 10 to the minus 23 electron volts. Ultralight axions give us the right relative density for gut scale initial misalignments. 
So part of the game is to try and constrain these guys will give us constraints on gut scale physics. And we'll see that this entire range, 10 to the minus 23 to 10 to the minus 15, EV can be probed by, by cosmology and astrophysics. And I will talk about constraints on this entire range in lectures uh, six, se in lectures seven and eight, I think. Six, seven and eight, or seven and eight? Seven and eight. Seven and eight will cover all these constraints. Okay. Initial field value caution, as I said. Um, normally, um, you can just take this initial field value as a completely free parameter. Don't forget the inflationary fluctuations. Um, the initial field value in the formula is really the square, is really the root mean square of the spatially averaged initial field value. So you have your uniform mean field <coughs> and your vacuum fluctuations. For these ultralight axion models, the decay con and you put the decay constant near the gut scale. As long as theta is order one, the first term dominates because Hubble inflation is known to be less than 10 to the 14 GeV. We'll, this, we'll come back to this again and again. Um, but this assumption that we have a free parameter here, independence of inflation, is only valid if theta i times fa is much larger than its inflation. So we cannot set phi equals zero. We can't get rid of axion energy density. Um, we cannot get rid of the axion energy density in this scenario. You always get this contribution from H inflation. Um, you have this minimum contribution. And if FA is smaller than 10 to the 14 GeV, the, infl the inflationary contribution will do can, can dominate if the tensor to scalar ratio is large for any value of theta. Um, if this is confusing to you, I'll redefine or I'll say why and define all these parameters in lecture six. We'll return to the role of the inflation energy scale and the tensor to scale ratio. Okay, what important lessons um, have we made from this very simple solution? The most important solution is that a scalar field behaves like dark matter whenever the Hubble constant is smaller than mass. The energy density goes like one over a cube. That is the definition of behaving like matter. So coherent oscillations of the field look like um, pressureless particles. The other important thing is that when the Hubble constant is larger than the mass, the axioms behave like dark energy and have negative pressure. So you have this transition in the equation of states um, governed by the evolution of the Hubble parameter. Um, in order to actually have the axioms be the dark energy, or to be the infoton, um, inflation and dark energy are just two sides of the same coin, and the potential needs to dominate and be compact um, in the Friedman equation. So in order to have dark energy, 3h squared m plant squared should be of order in this approximation, a half m squared theta squared f squared. So h has to be larger than m, so that implies that f must be of order or larger than the Planck scale, in order for an axion to give you a trivial um, dark energy or inflation candidate. For a single axion, this runs into problems um, known as the gravity conjecture or the swamp land, or the swamp land. and this is the subject of intense study at the moment, of course. Um, dark energy, for dark energy, this is relatively easy. You only need to maintain this condition, H larger than M, for you know, a few E-folds, uh, one E-fold, dark energy only took over the, pre, the current expansion at a redshift of one to two or something. Um, so dark energy is actually relatively easy. You don't need to violate this weak gravity conjecture much. Um, inflation is hard because you require maintaining this over a very long range in your potential because inflation has to go on for at least 16 volts. So axion dark energy should be easy as long as the mass is small enough. Axion inflation much harder. Okay. But I'm not going to talk about axion inflation or axion dark energy much or if at all for the rest of the lecture. So let's focus on the dark matter case. Okay, so let's start breaking up our scales in cosmology. What, what, how are we going to pick different masses um, and confront your scales in cosmology? Let's consider the Hubble scale at different epochs. So this um, here, I'm drawing the axion mass. And below it, I will label the physics of what's going on 
and the Hubble scale on the bottom. This is going to be early times on the left and late times at the right. So what do we know? We know that the universe was hot on scales um, on temperatures below BBN. What was the Hubble scale at BBN? The Hubble scale at BBN was 10 to the minus 15 electron volts. Temperature 1 MeV, um, Hubble scale 10 to the minus 15 MeV. The axions with a mass uh, larger than 10 to the minus 15 EV must have, under, must have passed this H order M transition before BBN. Before BBN, you have to account for the evolution of G star. At BBN, G star is basically a constant. Before BBN, you can be affected by the evolution of G star um, and you can be affected by entropy production. And you may even be in one of these matter dominated epochs that I talked about. So the relic density for axions with mass higher than 10 to the minus 15 EV requires some care and some cosmological instructions to, to compute. Um, just as it does for computing the relic density of a wimp. The other important scale, I've already told you what the Hubble scale today is in, in proper units, 10 to the minus 33 electron volts. If the axion is lighter than 10 to the minus 33 EV, that transition H less than M has not occurred. So the field is still frozen by the Hubble friction and it basically just contributes to the effective cosmological constant and behaves like dark energy. This range in between is the range where, ax where the ultralight axions can give the correct relic density for gut scale decay constants and is the range where we can do, where we can really learn about the axion mass from cosmology. <coughs> Let's put in the next scale that we know, matter radiation equality. Temperature of about one EV, Hubble scale of 10 to the minus 28 EV. So axions um, that only pass this H less than M condition um, mm. after matter radiation equality are going to look somewhat like um, dark energy or neutrinos during the late time expansion of the universe. This affects how they affect the CMB. So 10 to the minus 28 to 10 to the minus 33 EV, you're somewhat dark energy or neutrino-like. What other scales do we know? We know the Hubble scale when the first fluctuations um, were going non-linear. So the, so the Hubble scale corresponding to a horizon size, what, what do I say? The non-linear scale today first entered the horizon, when did the non-linear scale today first enter the horizon? The non-linear scale today, K of about 0.1 to 1 inverse megaparsec, first entered the horizon when Hubble was 10 to the minus 24 electron volts. So axials with, with any mass between 10 to the minus 24 and 10 to the minus 33 EV are almost entirely linear today. They only started behaving like matter when fluctuation, when um, when the horizon size was already bigger than the nonlinear scale. So all this range, 10 to the minus 24 to 10 to the minus 33 EV, we can probe using, line, using linear cosmological perturbation theory, which we'll discuss in great detail next lecture. So we can probe these axions, 10 to the minus 24 to 10 to the minus 33, using large scale structure, using the cosmic microwave background, and any other tracer of the large scale structure. The range here is most interesting if the axions are going to be all of the dark matter, because we know dark matter clusters non-linearly. Non so we know that these axions in 10 to the minus 24, 10 to the minus 33 must be subdominant in the dark matter because they're not clustering non-linearly. We know dark matter forms galaxies. But we also know the, what, what perturbation entered the horizon. Um, what was the horizon, what was the Hubble scale when the perturbations that are today making up dwarf galaxies entered the horizon. The Hubble scale at that time was 10 to the minus 22 electron volts, corresponding to decays of about 10 inverse megaparsecs. This gives us a rough lower bound on dark matter. Axioms in this regime here, 10 to the minus 24 to 10 to the minus 22, they're going to have a large effect on galaxy formation that can be modeled using the halo model and they're somewhat warm dark matter like. And then the fuzzy dark matter that we've been talking about with Jens lives in this regime here, 10 to the minus 22 EV and above. So this is very nonlinear. We need to talk about solitons. 
The frequency of these oscillations, if I convert 10 to the minus 22 into a frequency, the frequency at which the action field is oscillating, these have frequencies of oscillation um, in this window much less than one hertz. This is going to impact direct searches for these that we'll talk about in lectures nine and 10. So, and I can now divide my space into two. I can do precision cosmology of axions and really limit their energy density as a function of their mass in about the range 10 to minus 22 to 10 to minus 33. This is because I can only do precision cosmology on linear and quasi-linear scales. And this 10 to the minus 22 EV gives us the rough dark matter lower bound. And anything I say about axions above this mass depends on, non, uh, depends on strongly nonlinear physics. And this is the subject of lenses lectures. Okay. So this might simple solution that I gave you. Sorry, Johnny, could I ask you a quick question? Yes, of course. You said that's a lower bound on dark matter? Yes. On, on, so I guess I'm used to thinking of 10 to the minus 22 EV as, uh, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, I'm just confused. All right, it's a lower bound on the mass. Right, right. If you want to be all the dark matter. Right, and above that, it can't be for various reasons. Yeah, above that, you can't be all of the dark matter. Yep. But because you, own, you, have, you affect cosmological observables on linear and quasi-linear scales, in this regime, 10 to the minus 22 and, a, and below, you can put strong constraints on the energy density of axions. Right. OK, thank you. OK, um, yeah, so, so this nice picture that I gave you, computing the relative density and getting some bounds, applies to our ultralight axions, where all the oscillations happen after BBN, and applies to our stringy axions where the mass is constant and where I can set the potential to be about m squared phi squared, because I don't know any better. For the QCD axion, we have to revoke all of our previous simplifying assumptions to compute the relic density. Why is that? Okay, so this makes us unhappy. Um, it makes the relic density cal calculation a lot harder. Um, but not really that much, not, not, not too much harder, it's still ODEs in, in this scenario B. Okay, so what are, are our simplifying assumptions? The QCD axion, it turns out, will, will begin its oscillations in the pre-BBN epoch. So we cannot model the Hubble parameter as this single fluid. Um, A goes like T over T, 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 A goes like T to some power, Hubble goes like one over T. We have to include the evolution of G star, you have to worry about the um, entropy production, QCD phase transition, all this stuff that you have to in a normal relic density calculation. We, for the QCD axiom, we know the, how the, pot the potential evolves as a function of temperature on scales of order 100 MeV on the QCD scale. Turns out that this is exactly when the axion is starting to oscillate. We have to worry about this temperature evolution of the potential. But fortunately, we already showed that this can be computed. Fi finally, we can do better than the m squared phi squared approximation to the potential because we know the unharmonicities in these two limits, dilute instant on gas and the chiral perturbation theory limit. So we know the full potential, so why not just solve the evolution in the full potential? Um, and finally, the relic density for the QCD axiom um, can be, the right relic density can be achieved for low values of the decay constant. For those right axions, we only got the right relic density when F was much larger, um, than, when F was larger than 10 to the 14 GeV. So we could basically throw out the inflationary contribution. For the QCD axion, we cannot throw out that inflationary contribution um, in scenario B. So we covered all of these points in lecture one. So let me just quickly recap them. We know G star as a function of T. This is taken from the paper by Borsanyi et al. Um, and you need to use it. So you can get a fit for G star from Borsanyi, modeled through the QCD phase transition from lattice QCD. Once in Shellard, also give an analytic fit to this, which, which, you, which is useful. We also know, we know the temperature evolution of the axion mass, zero value of the topological susceptibility, 75.6 MeV to the four, 
for Sanyi, there was tabulated fitting functions for this computed on the lattice. And you had this T minus four behavior at, temper at um, temperatures larger than the QCD scale, uh, but smaller than the charm mass. We know this potential in chiral perturbation theory. It's this at t strictly at t equals zero. It has this shape and at temperatures larger than lambda QCD, but it has this diluted instance on gas shape. And again, the transition between these two shapes is not really known. And this gives some uncertainty to the QCD axiom density for certain values of the decay constant, which I will discuss. Okay. An important thing that you see in this case is the um, we can still use our approximation that we go from a constant um, density or some approximately constant density to behaving like matter at some temperature. We can use this to derive the scaling of the QCD axiom relative density with the decay constant. So, okay, recall the Friedman equation, recall how the axiom mass depends on temperature, and recall the zero value of the axiom mass. Approximating G star is a series of step functions, so just saying it is some value at T os. You can work out the, um, the temperature of oscillation, its power law dependence on the axiom the K constant, substituting in all of these definitions. The oscillation temperature goes at FA for minus one over N plus two, where N is this number here. Due to the mass evolution, we have to make another, we, we can't just use this constant ax, constant density one over a cubed. So we've whipped that when the oscillations occur, but we can't take this um, we can't use this approximation we introduced before. You can't say it's just an early time dark energy and then an immediate transition to dark matter. We have to account for the temperature evolution of the mass. But we can account for it in the following way using what's called an adiabatic invariant. So once the axiom begins to oscillate, um, by definition, temperature evolves on scales of order Hubble from the Friedman equation. By definition, once the oscillations occur, once mass is larger than H, this evolution of the temperature is slow compared to the frequency of the axion oscillation, which is of order M. This implies that there's an adiabatic invariant. The adiabatic invariant A um, is one over two pi, integral, integral over a cycle of PDQ for the canonical coordinates P and Q, um, canonical conjugate coordinates. In this case, Q is just the axion field theta, and the conjugate momentum P is, is scale factor A cubed times theta dot. This adiabatic invariant allows us to um, fix uh, this approximation to the case that is relevant when the temperature evolves with mass, when the mass evolves with temperature. Here it is. This implies that it is not just it is not the actual energy density that, that goes like one over a cubed and is conserved, but the co-moving number density is conserved, and then we must take into account separately the temperature evolution of the mass. So for times after, after actually an oscillation have begun, the energy density is a function of temperature, is the mass at that temperature times the number density at that temperature, but the number density is conserved. So we have the number density at the time of oscillations, scaled like one over a cubed, times the mass at this new temperature T. The number density where oscillations um, begin, is just the mass when the oscillations begin times theta squared f squared, where we've averaged theta squared over, some, over the cycle of oscillation. Then finally, we need to use entropy conservation. So also remember, so G star is evolving during these temperatures. We can't just take A goes like one over T. We have to include the change in G star. A of T goes like G star to the minus one third T inverse. When you substitute all of these definitions in using the same scaling with T os that we computed a few slides ago, you find that the axion relic density scales with F in the following way, and I leave this as an exercise. Omega A H squared goes like F A to the N plus three over N plus two, where N is the power law with which the mass evolves with mass squared evolves with temperature. 
if you substitute in the commonly used N equals <coughs> four approximation with those instant on gas, you get the relatively well-known scaling omega a h squared goes at f a to the seven sixth power. And this is, so this kind of seems really weird. You see it and you go, like, where did this power law come from? The energy density goes like f squared. Why is this f a to the seven sixth? It's because of the temperature dependence of the mass appearing here. And the temperature dependence of the mass appearing here in this definition, 3h goes equals m, giving us this funny scaling. So we got a bunch of funny scalings all coming from the temperature evolution of the mass. Okay. There is another um, increase in complexity here. The adiabatic invariance only applies strictly when the potential is in the harmonic regime. So we, this, the number density is only, conserved, is only um, co moving conserved for harmonic oscillations and harmonic potential, which brings us to the last point, and harmonic corrections. In general, you just have to compute these numerically. It's a nonlinear ordinary differential equation. So you have to solve the evolution of the axial field in the full potential, including all of your temperature. So in general, everything here is nonlinearly coupled. You just have to compute this numerically. And however, you can fit them and apply them to our existing approximations. So it's common to express it as the axial relative density is some anharmonic correction, which depends on the initial field value times the harmonic contribution in which the initial field value scales out because of the harmonic version being from a linear equation. And we know the asymptotic form that our anharmonic corrections have to take. The anharmonic correction has to go to one when theta is small, when your harmonic approximation works. And then harmonic correction goes to infinity when theta goes to pi. So when theta goes to pi, the field sits on top on a flat potential and never moves. So, so the energy, so the, um, the energy density will just go like um, dark energy all the way from the initial time to now, and basically the energy density will diverge. The particular form of this f as a function of theta, the, the form of the divergence can actually be can actually be, be proven um, for a, for a polynomial potential beyond um, phi, m squared phi squared. This is done in a paper by Live from ninety two. And he also shows some, some plots of this function on the his approximations. You can show that MA at the time of oscillations times the time of oscillations has some logarithmic divergence. Um, and then Q of theta over pi is just some polynomial in Q. Um, you, so you can find a bunch of, uh, you can find a bunch of ways to fit this. Um, I, we give some fits in this relic density paper that I wrote with Alberto Diaz Theodor. Um, I have my own action relic density code that computes all of this, um, if you would like to look at it. And, um, and set seven, <coughs> who um, is on the other end here, um, has a relic density code um, in his Gambit um, calculations. Okay, so. We can fit all of this, of course. And if you take some fit for this, the formula you can find in my review, or in, um, I just took them from this paper by um, Fox, Pierce, and Thomas. We have two parameters in our model with the QCD axiom. We have the initial misalignment angle and the decay constant. So you plot the relative density as a function of the initial misalignment angle and the decay constant using, using um, Paddy Fox's fits. In this part of the plane, again, you're excluded. You have too much dark matter. Below this, you're allowed. You have sort of dominant axiom dark matter. And along this curve, you get the right value of the right density. If you pick theta order one, you can compute the F that you need. F should be about 10 to the 11 GeV if theta is equal to one. As I make theta smaller, I'm allowed to have larger and larger values of F. We approach this problem of the oscillations occurring during the QCD phase transition for f of order 10 to the 16, 10 to the 17 GeV. So in this um, large f regime, the, there are 
many more theoretical uncertainties in the relic density. And then if I take theta towards pi, the anharmonic corrections take over. You also have some numerical uncertainty, but then you're allowed to make f much smaller. Which brings us on to scenario A. So this was all in this simple as possible um, case to compute the axiom relic density. All I need to do is solve ODEs with some initial field value. They might be nonlinear, they might be temperature dependent, but I can just look all of this stuff up and solve an ODE on my laptop and it's very easy. Scenario B, sorry, scenario A, where the axion symmetry, where the Petri-Quinn symmetry is only broken after inflation is much, much harder. Because in this case, you cannot neglect the field gradients. When you can't neglect gradients, ODEs become PDEs and everything, and life is much, much harder. So, um, so here's some reading for this, uh, for this scenario. So you can read about it in my, in my review. Um, these two very recent papers, Vaccaro et al, the early seeds of axion mini clusters, and Gorgetto, axions from strings, the attractive solution, are the current um, state of the art. There's also a 2018 paper by the um, Japanese group Hiromatsu et al. Um, I refer to that earlier one because it's much longer, longer and more um, and more complete. But then, but their most recent paper um, agrees with the results of Vaccaro and Gorgetto for reasons I will now talk about. Okay, so let's formulate the problem. If the Petri quinn symmetry is only broken after inflation, I don't just need to solve the evolution of the axion field. I need to solve the classical evolution of the entire Petri quinn field. So as well as being PDE, I've got an extra degree of freedom. So I need to solve the problem of spontaneous symmetry breaking. So here's my action. I now have the complex Petri quinn field and the full Petri quinn potential. I have my full Petri quinn potential is is the wine bottle potential for the Petri and Quinn field plus my temperature dependent contribution for the axion. The one minus cosine theta potential, um, if I choose my um, axis correctly, is just, the, is just proportional to the real part of the Petri and Quinn field. It's just a linear, a linear tilt of your wine bottle that comes in as a function of temperature. So the field, the Petri and Quinn field, will initially begin at the origin, uh, if the temperature is large enough um, that the fluctuations don't pick, um, the fluctuations make the potential approximately quadratic, so you can neglect the, um, the fluctuations are large, you neglect the symmetry breaking part and you would just be localized at the origin, and some small fluctuations. At high temperature, we also neglect the QCD contribution to potential, so we have the following equation of motion for the complex Petri Quinn field. Phi double dot plus the H phi dot minus grad squared phi plus D phi V equals zero. So we just evolve <coughs> this DDV on the temperature dependent background. Okay, we cannot neglect the gradient energy because the symmetry breaking is going to, because there's going to be a symmetry breaking and then the Hubble horizon is going to grow and encompass different volumes. So this is a PDE problem, we need to do lattice field theory, but we don't, we don't need to do lattice QFT, just lattice classical field theory. Okay, so let's go back to our cartoon of spontaneous symmetry breaking, but now for the um, Petri Quinn field. When the Hubble parameter is much larger than the mass of the Petri Quinn field, it doesn't see this curvature and the field just sits wherever you put it. And in this case, I put it in the middle. So when Hubble is large compared to the mass of the Petri Quinn field, which is of order FA, which you can see just by expanding this potential, then the VEV will remain zero. And I have a, the continuous shift symmetry and the Goldstone mode of the axion. When the Hubble constant drops below the mass of the Petri Quinn field, it acquires a VEV. The VEV is equal to FA over root two. And the axion field phi is, is the Goldstone mode. But here we're going to have to follow now the dynamics of the Petri Quinn field, the oscillations of the Petri Quinn field in this well of the wine bottle potential. Okay, so 
Uh, what happens to the axion fluctuations when symmetry breaking happens? Let's consider no potential for the axion. We switch this off. What happens to a massless, um, to a massless scalar field in an expanding universe? Um, how does it get smooth? What happens to it? This is described by what's called the Kibble mechanism. So the, this, this, act, this, this falling off of the wine bottle potential and picking a VEV happens locally. It happens within a given horizon volume. But due to the shape symmetry, theta, we can't define a, value of, a, a global value of theta. So theta is only defined within the causally connected region. Within that causally connected region, I can define a some value of theta. I can say, okay, it equals one or two or whatever. It doesn't matter because it's a shift symmetry, but I pick some value. And then it's given by theta double dot plus three H theta dot minus NABO squared theta equals zero. If we, do, if we do a Fourier transform, we can see that the gradients of the field act like a mass. So theta double dot plus three H theta dot plus K squared theta equals zero. So whatever value I pick for the field, which doesn't matter because it's got a shift symmetry, starts to matter when the k becomes larger than h. So when the wave number of the fluctuation becomes larger than Hubble, you now, the value of the field takes on a meaning within the horizon. The k acts like a mass and the field begins oscillating and goes to its local minimum. But between different horizon volumes, you can't compare what the value of theta is. Okay, so the field is driven to zero by the gradient potential within the patches where H is less than K, but globally there's just this shift symmetry, so I can't define what that value of theta is um, between different horizons. Yeah, the patches are only locally defined, so theta, this zero that you're driven to, is a different, is a different value picked randomly between different horizon patches. This leads to the formation of topological defects. This is the Kibble mechanism. Okay, as H shrinks, H shrinks. This K on which on which the field becomes local um, gets larger. So at some point, the the, the 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 smooth patches from one horizon start meeting the smooth patches from another. And at this point, you, could, you, start, you have actually broken the shift symmetry from the gradients, and you have to start comparing different values that didn't know about each other before. And as I said, this leads to the formation of topological defects. Okay, this leads to the formation of strings in the petche quin field, in the complex petche quin field. You also cannot, at this point, um, separate out the evolution of the radial and angular mo moments of the petri quin field. You have to use the full field. Okay, so this process, um, this Kibble mechanism, leads us to have a map, it leads us, forces us to take a mapping from the complex plane of the field, which has symmetry group U1, the potential has this U1 symmetry, just multiplications by a phase, and um, has to map U1 to the physical space in which these dynamics are happening. The physical space here is Euclidean space with symmetry group R3. So we have to map U1 to R3, and this is what gives us topological defects. Okay, so here's my um, attempt to, to explain this, which I hope might make it more clear to you. So let's consider just the plane of um, coordinates in physical space x, y. Next, let's consider the complex plane of our field phi. And here I use an arrow, a blue arrow, to, to denote the state of the field phi. If the arrow has this little length here, um, then the field has a radial value, fa over root two, sitting in its minimum along the heel of the wine bottle. And that's a circle in the complex phi plane. Now I have to pick values of this into real space. Let me draw in real space the horizon size L order 1 over H. Okay, 
So I put the field with value fa over root two at some angle in a horizon in a horizon um, patch. There can be places in the physical plane y over x in which the field undergoes a winding. So due to the R, u1 to r3 mapping, there are points that there, there will always be some points in the physical space r3 where the field undergoes a complete winding. Remember now that the, 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 the theta, there is no defined value of theta. Theta still has a shift symmetry. So I can't get rid of this. But what is the value of theta in the middle? If I was just talking about, about the field theta, the value of theta is not defined at points um, enclosed by a complete winding of the complex field. Okay, so let's now say, what is the value, absolute value of the Petro Quinn potential in interior to this region? If the Petro Quinn potential takes zero, this corresponds to the value in the bottom in the heel, but in the center of the, of the wine bottle, the Petro Quinn field takes value lambda fa to the four over four. This UV completion of the axion field theta by the full Petro Quinn complex field tells us what to do with the, with the field in the middle of this region. In the middle of this region, theta is not defined. Phi goes to zero, and the potential takes, it, takes this large value. It sits in the middle, and the symmetry is unbroken. So the symmetry is unbroken in the center, and we form this string, and the energy density of the string will be of order f to the four. So this is what we see here. The, um, I can't remember when I will get to this, but it's clear that this um, whole thing will, will unwind when the axiom mass becomes important. Once the axiom mass becomes important, I pick a special value of theta, theta break the shift symmetry, all of these, so let's say now all of these uh, little arrows, when the axiom mass becomes important, all point in the same direction. They all move down and oscillate about the middle of the potential. They all move around and pick the same value. At that point, the Petre Quinn field is unpinned from having to sit at the origin and falls off. And so the strings decay when the axial mass stretches on, because then you unwind all of these to point in the same direction and phi can fall off. But at the moment, the axion is massless. So, these, so it's pinned at its initial value, all of these points here, go like this. And the size of the strings is of order the horizon size at whatever time you're at. This makes the problem very hard to simulate. So here's um, a picture of what this looks like, um, taken from um, some slides uh, by, uh, that Javi Redondo showed at the last Patrick's meeting. This is Javi's simulations of this. So the action strings formed by the Kibble mechanism, and the energy is log logarithmically distributed around this, temp this tension. Okay, so initially, the Hubble horizon is very small, and you have this spontaneous symmetry breaking. He's shown here the, ax the value of the axion field between minus pi and pi, and he's used a clever color scheme that maps them together. So spontaneous symmetry breaking happens. The Hubble horizon is very small. You get lots and lots of random values of the axion field. As time goes on, the horizon size grows and smooths the field on all of the horizon. So his circles here are the horizon size. So you see in the next plot, the horizon size has grown. The, the, the field decays and within the horizon became smaller and smaller. So, they, so you had to smooth the field. You had to know what was going on between different horizon patches. So it just grew up to the, the scale over which the field is randomized, gets larger and larger. But this carries on happening. And then at this final time, when L is a, uh, he shows us L of order H inverse and zooms in on a point, this point has a winding of the axion field. It goes all the way from white, blue, black, red, and back to white. Around this point, the field theta is not defined. 
and you have to use the complex field. So what happens when it's for the complex field? What can we say about it? So what is the profile of this complex field in the plane here in the cylindrical coordinates centered on x, y, and z moving out the board? The complex field can be parameterized in the following way. Phi is equal to fa over root 2 times g e to the i psi. Okay, the function g of x has the following asymptotic properties. g of x goes to zero as x goes to zero, i.e. as x goes to zero, um, as the, so here, uh, the g of r radial coordinate, as r goes to zero, phi goes to zero, the potential goes from zero to Lambda f to the four. That's at the origin, the unbroken, where Petri point symmetry is unbroken. And then um, g of x goes to one as x goes to infinity, i.e., phi takes on the value f over root two, um, broken Petri point symmetry. Uh, now you have this string solution, and you would like to solve for the dynamics of what happens to the complex Petri point field. You can do this approximately by just saying, I have some strings and I solve the Nambu Goto action. Then I don't have to worry about the scale FA in the problem being very, very different than the Hubble scale. I just have some strings, but you don't know how they interact. It's an approximation. You have to say something about what, how they can link and all of this, but you don't have to worry about hierarchies. You have to put in all the properties of the strings by hand. But um, in a modern approach, we've just got much more powerful computers. We can just brute for, try and brute force solve the evolution of the strings by solving the Klein-Gordon equation for the complex field phi. We don't need to make any approximation. We just solve spontaneous symmetry breaking, form some strings, solve the dynamics. Okay, so you can do this. And here's a video um, from the paper by Gorgetto et al. Um, from Gorgetto's YouTube channel. So here we go. Spontaneous symmetry breaking happens. You form some strings. Then as the Hubble horizon grows, it erases the strings on its own scale because you have to keep coherence patches. And you end up with a certain number of strings per Hubble size. So here is the Hubble horizon growing in his simulation. This is the box of order the Hubble horizon. And you see that you've always got about the same number of strings inside the Hubble horizon. This is this so-called attractor behavior. Um, that is the subject of uh, so much controversy in the axiom relative density. Okay, let's just watch that again um, in case I was saying too much at the beginning. Okay, so now the Hubble horizon is very small and as it grows, it raises strings on its own scale. So, that, um, so, you, so they have to, you have to keep the axiom field uniform within a Hubble patch because of this k squared term um, and this and this carries on going and the um, Hubble horizon grows and you enter a scaling solution with a number of strings per horizon volume. Okay. What does the color mean? Uh, the color here is the, oh, I don't know actually. I presume it's the value of the Petri Quinn field. Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's the value of the axiom field. No, it can't be that. Um, don't know. Okay. Um, so now he's saying, okay, great. I can just solve this problem. Um, classical lattice field theory. Maybe I can just get the answer for what's the axiom. What is the axiom density at the end of this process? This is what you want to know. You want to solve the string dynamics up until the time when the axiom mass becomes a border Hubble and the strings unwind and then just compute the, the energy density in, axion field, in, the, in the axion field theta at the end of this process. Why can't you just solve this um, all the way through? The reason is that the strings form when the Hubble scale becomes of order the mass of the radial Petri Quinn mode, which is of order Fa, but the axion field only starts oscillating when Hubble becomes of order the axion mass. 
And these two masses are hierarchically separated. Okay, so you need to start off, find your string. The string has size of order the horizon when the Petri quin symmetry is broken. The physical size of the string is this. But then the horizon grows and the string remains at the same size. I need to follow this evolution all the way up until when the axiom field begins oscillating. Physically, um, when, when you do this solution numerically, you can only follow it up until the log of um, um, mass of the radial mode over Hubble at your final time, which is the, which is the ratio of the size of the, of the side length of the box to the radius of the circle. Numerically, this can only really be achieved up until about um, a log, log ratio of six, when we really need to solve it up to a log ratio of 70. So the hierarchy between the scales is um, d to the 70, but you can only solve it on scales of e to the six. So there are three ways to deal with this problem. Um, and they've all been addressed in the literature. Hiramatsu and Gorgetto um, simulate it over a small log range and then make some extrapolation to find the final axion density. The danger is, of course, that the axion right density that you find depends on, your extra on how you make your extrapolation. So you should be careful. Another solution is to use the so-called pre um, press riding spurgle or fat string approximation. Gorgetto explores both. Vaquero used the fat string. That means that you input some, some fake dynamics that fix the size of the string to be a constant ratio with respect to the Hubble scale. But obviously then you're not getting the right dynamics because you're not solving the Klein-Gordon equation. So maybe you get the wrong answer. And then there is another way to do this um, due to Guy, Guy Moore and collaborators, which is to a variant on the fat string approach um, that introduces a second field in order to kind of guarantee um, that you don't get too many hierarchies, um, but presumably capture the dynamics a little bit better than just the uh, naive press riding spurgle trick. Um, but I would refer you to the papers, the paper by Guy Moore to really discuss um, this because I don't, I don't claim to understand this method. Okay, so where do the axions come from from this? Why, why does this matter for the red density? So, Axions from strings is nothing weird. It's just a variation on, on the vacuum realignment. It's not something different. It is just scalar fields oscillating in harmonic potentials giving matter. It is nothing different than the vacuum realignment mechanism. It's just vacuum realignment with a PDE instead of an ODE. That's all it is. Um, yeah, so we say strings decay into axions, but it's all just field oscillations. What you need to compute is the energy density in strings which is of order the energy density in the axion field theta at the end of the simulation. So the energy, because the strings carry, carry, much, carry most of the energy density in this case, the energy density in the string is F to the four, um, and the energy density in the axion fields away from the strings is much, much smaller than this. So the energy density gets trapped in the strings. The energy density in the strings is the uh, number of strings per horizon, number of strings per horizon times the string tension divided by t squared. So the string tension is f squared log f times dA, where dA is the um, strings per horizon measured with respect to the Hubble parameter. And then it evolves um, with time in this way. The so-called scaling solution, if you have a perfect scaling solution, then the number of strings per horizon volume goes to a constant, which you just measure. And then if you remain in a perfect scaling solution, you now know how you just go follow the scaling solution up until when the axion begins oscillating, turn all of the string energy into axions, scale it like one over a cubed, should be easy. However, the thing that, um, that Gorgetho noticed is that there is not a perfect scaling solution. It's rather an attractor solution where psi goes to psi of t with a logarithmic violation of the scaling solution. So there's some logarithmic time evolution of psi. 
But because you need to follow the whole evolution for a factor of log six to log 70, the effect of this scaling violation, of this logarithmic scaling violation can be very important. Okay, so we need to find the axion number density at the time when the axion oscillations begin. And then we use our number density scaling from previously. The number density in axions is just the integral over k of the density power spectrum in the strings. Because at the end, we're just going to turn all the string density into axions. So we integrate over k the, state, the, the string spectrum. And this is where all the controversy in the early 90s over the axion density from strings um, comes from. So in the early 90s, there were famous arguments between um, Shellard, Shellard's group, who did one type of simulation, and Sakivi's group, who did another type of simulation. Um, one, I think one was uh, Nambu Goto, and one was a fat string simulation, but I don't know. Obviously, these both involved approximations because the computing power at the time was not as good as today. Um, and they tried to compute this spectrum, the rho by dk, integrate it, and find the energy density. Uh, the current state of the art, I'll show you. Okay, so this is um, a plot from Gorgetto et al. Of the, um, dense, of the power spectrum, and they choose, a, they choose a clever normalization that takes out all of the effects of the um, normal scaling solution and the um, time evolution. So the spectrum takes on a universal form. However, it's high k cutoff is important because you have to integrate over all k. So the UV behavior of this spectrum is important. So here they are, they simulate for different values of this final ratio, this final, how big is the string compared to the horizon size. And they do three different simulations at log four, log five, log six. And you see that the spectrum evolves. And you have this contribution here, it's falling like a power law. So okay, maybe eventually, uh, you know, the, the overall integral of this will converge um, and you can work out what it is. So what um, Gorgesso et al. did is they tried to tell us what is the theoretical uncertainty. They didn't want to say, this is the answer. They wanted to say, what is the theoretical uncertainty on the, con on the axiom relative density from, from, from string decay? So, so you parameterize your ignorance. So you parameterize the way in which you extrapolate this power spectrum using either the standard scaling solution, the attractor with logarithmic violations, and then variations thereof. Okay, so how do we parameterize our ignorance? So the way, um, the way I give it, and I think it's quite useful, is to say, well, what can we compute? What can I compute? And then what kind of correction can I get from these lattice things? So what I can compute is do the naive vacuum realignment, which we had before. And so we know that the vacuum realignment basically happens in the individual patches, um, but because of this growth of the horizon, the decay of the strings, the current universe is many, many, many different patches. So the horizon now encompasses many individual patches from before. So I take the naive misalignment result averaged over the distribution of, the, of, of initial thetas. So I compute in the formulae for the relative density before, theta squared times down harmonic correction, and I average that over the distribution for theta, which is just the uniform distribution minus pi to pi. If there was no anharmonic correction, this average was pi squared over three, so I can substitute it into the formulae, and then I have some anharmonic correction to the, to the naive misalignment results, which can be just expressed as some constant C. C is of order two for the unharmonic corrections from the QCB axion potential. Then we introduce a, a fudge factor onto this result from fitting to um, the simulations of Gorgetto and company. So this is the idea. Omega AH squared is omega AH squared from misalignment times what I call one plus alpha deck. So if the contribution of axions from strings was Negligible, alpha deck would be zero. If strings give you a lot of axion energy density, alpha deck could be 100 or more. Or the strings could actually 
get rid of cold dark matter axions by producing relativistic axions. If the axions from the strings are relativistic, alpha can be negative. So this is how this, is how this was parameterized by Gorgetto et al. So Gorgetto et al show, okay, here's log of m over h. Here's the range they can simulate, logs of between four and six. And then they extrapolate this and extrapolate their power spectrum. According to their extrapolate, depending on their extrapolation, you get completely different values for that energy density. So one, i.e. alpha of zero, is the misalignment contribution here. Then depending on the extrapolation, you get different amounts of axions from strings. Alpha order one is a linear extrapolation, which assumes the standard scaling solution, and was the results found in 2012 by the Japanese collaboration here at Echo. Alpha order one, so then you have about the same amount of axions from naive misalignment in strings. Of course, these are just the same thing. They're just, they're just classical field oscillations. There's no difference between them, but it's nice to split them this way to parameterize our ignorance. Alpha order one with a linear extrapolation. However, if you use the logarithmic scaling violation that um, Bogretta et al. claimed to see, you can get alpha much larger, order 100. But given that they don't know how to make this extrapolation, you could even have alpha less than zero, and that would be down here. Um, and this is also claimed from certain simulation methods. So there is a lot of uncertainty here, and that is what Gorgata et al. were trying to tell us. How does this translate into the axion decay constant? So the nice thing about, the, about this scenario A, where the axions, where the Petri Quinn symmetry is broken after inflation, it means that the QCD axion has only one free parameter. And then if you want, uh, that is the decay constant. Then, presumably, if you want it to be all the dark matter, you just say, this is the value of the decay constant. That tells you this is the value of the mass. So if you know the QCD axion mass, the, the, the experiments to detect the dark matter become incredibly easy. So I'll talk about axion dark matter searches in lectures nine and 10, but they, all, they are all resonance experiments or mostly resonance experiments. Resonance means you have to know the frequency. So axion dark matter experiments have to tune and it's this tuning when you don't know the frequency you're searching for that makes the experiments take time. But if you knew the frequency, you just turn your experiment to that and the scan on a single frequency takes, how, how long does the scan take, Eric? A single scan is a Yeah, so a couple of hundred seconds for ADMX. So if you knew the mass, you'd just go dink, find it in a couple of minutes. That's why these calculations are important. In this scenario A, there's just one parameter. So if you, if you could do this right, you could just go and find it. And then if you didn't find it, either axions were less than all the dark matter or they were in scenario B and you had all this freedom that I showed you before. But in principle, the scenario A is a one parameter model. So this is important. What does this look like though? Um, so what's the QCD action relic abundance? I'm gonna show you two uh, plots uh, that I've made. So this is one plot. Here's the log of the decay constant versus the log of this alpha parameter. Uh, alpha, um, if, so I'm only allowing alpha to be positive. So if alpha is positive, um, I have a minimum contribution to the uh, relative density from, this misalign from my naive misalignment contribution, which is here. So, so in this scenario A, the axiom decay constant cannot be bigger than about 10 to the 11 GeV the QCD axiom. If alpha is negative, it can of course be a little bit larger. This is known as the kind of classic window for the QCD axiom. Uh, but if alpha can be very large, say up to 100, which we saw is certainly possible with some of the extrapolations, then f can be as small as 10 to the 9 GeV, and this is the limit from um, stellar evolution, which we will, I think, see in lecture 9. Alpha can be enhanced further. I have only talked about axions from string decay, which corresponds to a color anomaly of one. If the color anomaly is larger than one, then I also have axion domain walls, and this whole story gets even more complicated. So I've only told you about basically the KSVZ model in scenario A. In scenario A, the DFSC model produces domain walls as well as strings. They may even just make the whole model invalid. 
you have to introduce something to, to get rid of the domain walls, it becomes a big mess. So I've only told you so far what happens in scenario A for KSVZ. Um, okay? So the axion mass, if F is of order 10 to the 11 G V, 10 to the 10, is a few is something like 10 to the minus 6 EV. Okay? So you know it should be about 10 to the minus 5 EV if F is 10 to the 11. There's the scaling. Um, I can show you this in a slightly different way for axion-like particles that still in, have some of the um, subtleties of the QCD axion. Um, and this, so here's an ALP, and I have allowed my ALP two parameters, FA and MA. I've also allowed some general temperature evolution of the axion mass and used my fitting function. Then I allow the, and then I plot contours when I get the right relic abundance. The solid line takes alpha equal to one, and the dotted line, um, I think, takes a slightly larger, a slightly smaller value of alpha, takes alpha equals zero, something like this. The QCD axion is a line on the MAF plane, so where the QCD axion MAFA line intersects, here n equals 3.34 in trans interacting instance on liquid model. Somewhere in this regime, somewhere in this ellipse, is the QCD axion, but you can do this for Alps. If F is larger in scenario B. Okay, so you work out where this ellipse is, and you set and say, this is my uncertainty on the QCD axion mass, including some uncertainties on temperature evolution, contribution of um, strings, etc., etc. QCD axion mass, in this case, would be somewhere between 10 to 100 micro EV. And this is a, there's a similar estimate done um, in the paper, on, in the SMASH paper by Ringwald et al. So it's variations on the QCD axion in scenario A sit somewhere around 10 to 100 micro EV. And this is a in, very interesting mass range that we'll see for direct detection. Um, can you target it with standard halo scopes? If not, what kind of thing do you need to detect this kind of thing on Earth? And so that will be in lectures nine and 10. Next time, um, we're going to return to the ultralight axions uh, in linear cosmological perturbation theory and hopefully meet um, what Jens has been doing. So, um, yep, I will see you tomorrow when we will return to ultralight axions. Thanks. Bye-bye, everybody.